Cam. Welcome to the Resource Insider Podcast today. I think you are the first person in here since we've got the the studio fully kitted out. We still got to get a, a shelf or something, but it's, it's coming along. Looks great. Well, you know, I took a lot of shit on the internet when we first built this <laughs> studio <laughs> with commenters telling me how ugly it was. So, you know, we did all right. And then we got this thing behind us. Uh, and it seems 50% of people love it and 50% hate it. So I think we've really hit the... It's probably the best you We've can hit the for. right balance there, yeah. <laughs> so welcome to the studio. Uh, you're in town from Toronto for a few days um, for Tarachi Gold, where you are the CEO. This is a conversation I've been looking forward to for some time. Uh, not only because you're running a company that I'm invested in and many Resource Insider members are invested in, but because you know we've been friends and known each other for, I was actually trying to think of how long that's been since I was about eighteen, so yeah. about a while, seventeen years now. Yeah, yeah. It's coming up on half our lives. Who would have thought we would still know <laughs> each other from playing rugby and getting drunk in first year university? And here we are, here seventeen we are. years later. So, for no, people that have never heard of Camp Teamster before, who've never heard the name Tarachi Gold, who are you guys? What do you do? Uh, well, I mean, Trachi Gold is a Mexico-focused exploration company, but with a side of a development <coughs> asset as well. I mean, we picked up the new project recently called the Magistral Mill and Tailings Project. Uh, it's a tailings reprocessing facility that we now own with a tailings resource next door. Uh, and our game plan with that asset is to get to cash producing status very quickly um, sometime in 2022, and then to use the cash flow from that asset to self-fund our own exploration efforts going forward um, up in Sonora, Mexico, where we have our Trachi Project. Okay, so exploration mm -hmm. and ideally near term cash flow in the reprocessing of tailings, correct? Exactly, yeah. So most people listening to this podcast will be familiar uh, with the idea of exploration, right? You're doing all the work, you're sticking holes in the ground, and you're looking to find a deposit. Right. What are reprocessing of tailings? Why is this an opportunity? You know, why can or should tailings be reprocessed, right? Because people who are not maybe as familiar with the mining industry would should and could assume that all the gold would have been effectively removed from tailings. And you know what, start by defining what tailings are and we'll take it from there. Sure, I mean, tailings are the waste product of mining operations. So typical mining operation, you're probably only gonna recover 1% or less of the actual mass of the mineral and ore that you mine from the facility, depending on what um, commodity you're producing. So in the case of gold, pretty much 100% of the tons of the material you take out of a mine, it's going to end up as a, a crushed fine grain material uh, in some sort of tailings basin in mm -hmm. the end. So basically it's the waste product of mining. And so it's after the gold has been crushed and grinded and chemically extracted and all these things that happen. And when you see these tailings facilities, uh, often there it's, it's kind of like a pile of muddy sand, right? And you see them in dams. Uh, often you see them covered in water because they come out of the processing plant quite wet, uh, often very, very wet. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been a lot in the news over the last few years about tailings, dams, facilities failing, notably, most notably in Brazil, but also yeah. in BC. Um, why is there an opportunity to reprocess these tailings today? So any, any mineral recovery process, whether that's for gold or copper or anything else, you're never gonna get 100% recovery uh, of the actual contained gold and copper that's in there. Mm -hmm. And you know, the further back you go in terms of mining history, the sort of you know, earlier stages or early phases of mining technology were less and less capable of recovering that gold or that copper. And so, for example, at our Magistral project in Mexico, the tailings that we have access to that are next to our mill, those tailings were generated originally from a mercury amalgamation plant that they were using to recover gold, starting from the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, uh, and later with the flotation process. Um, but now most gold is produced through the uh, leaching using cyanide, uh, which is much more effective at recovering fine grain gold from, from crushed material. And so the tailings that we now have access to uh, still contain a lot of gold because they didn't use more modern technologies historically to extract that material. And so there's still a lot of contained value in that tailings material. Uh, in our case, the grade of the gold there is approximately two grams per ton gold. And so there's a lot of mining operations today that are producing gold from significantly lower grade material. Well, man, if you've got half a gram per ton in Nevada and it's a heap leachable operation, that's, that's a pretty appealing project, right? Right, right. And so now we have four times that here in tailings. And the great thing about tailings is the fact that the material has already been excavated out of a pit or from an underground mine. It's already been crushed. It's already been ground. It's like a sand pile. It's like a pile of sand, exactly. Yeah. And the overburden has already been stripped and removed. 
So a lot of the economic activities and operational activities that typically go into a conventional gold mining operation to recover that gold, um, those are already sunk costs as well. A lot of that effort has already been paid for by the previous operators. So this sounds very obvious. Why aren't you guys a $100 million company right now? It seems pretty easy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it certainly has its own technical challenges, um, particularly on the, on the metallurgical side of things, because the low-hanging fruit has already been recovered by the previous operators. So it's up to us to make sure that we can economically extract what's remaining there, that sort of higher, harder to get gold that's still in the material. Uh, and so right now we're working with the Senko Engineering. We're doing some metallurgical test work on the tailings material uh, to make sure that the flow sheet that we move forward with is going to be economical and recover as much of that remaining gold as possible. Okay, so that touches on two things I want to I want to talk about: uh, recovery and scale. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's start with scale. So, you know, as you know, as many of our viewers will know, uh, in an exploration project, you know, once you know there's gold there, once you know whatever it is you're looking for is there. It's all about building out a resource, right? And you're yeah. doing infill drilling and you're trying to get an idea of how much is there, what size, what grade, all these things that really, uh, I guess, the dimensions of the deposit. Yeah. You know you've got this pile of tailings. Do you have to essentially explore that? Is, you know, is gold evenly distributed throughout it? Are there pockets of gold or as you would see in a normal deposit? How do you, how do you define what's there? What are you doing to do that or have you already done that? Sure. I mean, typically the first step for a tailings reprocessing operation is historical research. So finding out if you can get the historical records of the production from the old mining assets that were there. Um, Often they'll include, you know, what the average grade of the tailings was produced at that mine, uh, how those tailings were generated in terms of what sort of technology they were using also gives you some hints in terms of what's going to be contained in there. Um, But then just typically like a regular undeveloped gold deposit, we do need to go in there and drill out the tailings basin. Because like you said, there, there's not necessarily going to be a, hom- a homogenous resource there. Sure. Um, you're often going to find some distribution of gold um, based on perhaps the changing of the ore as they were mining different parts of the deposit. The ore could be different that they were processing, which means the tailings are going to be a little different. Uh, they could be grinding, grinding to a different size fraction and different types of their mining operation. Uh, and depending on where the outlet of the tailings uh, pipes were, uh, that can also have an effect on on how that's distributed uh, inside the actual tailings basin. And so uh, I worked on a tailings reprocessing facility in the United States for a couple of years. Uh, we were reprocessing iron ore from old uh, iron mine tailings dating back to the early 1900s. Uh, and we saw you know, a very concentrated distribution of, of the higher grade iron ore next to where the outlet pipes were, for example. Um, so we do have to go out and drill out that basin. That's something that we already completed earlier this year. Uh, and the samples from that we have at a lab up in, up in Canada. And we'll be looking at the gold distribution as well as the particle size distribution because uh, that will certainly have an impact on recoverability and mineability and things like that. Okay. Um, you know, obviously the, these, these things have already gone through the ringer once. The first round of gold has been removed. Mm-hmm. What do you anticipate being able to recover there? Have you done the met work to date that kind of gives you an idea of, say, those if it's remaining two grams per ton there, are you going to be able to get 90% of it, 50% of it? What, what do you anticipate? Um, based on some historical metallurgical test work, we're anticipating to recover probably between 70 and 75% of the remaining gold um, using a, a Merrill Crow um, cyanide leaching process. But we're going to be doing our own metallurgical test work, and that's the work that we're doing with Asenko right now, just to see if there's other ways that we can perhaps uh, add some additional material to the existing flow sheet of the existing facility that we have, uh, something that could potentially um, sort of remove or scalp off some of that, uh, some of that gold prior to the cyanidation. Um, you know, we also have the issue of, of some cyanide-soluble copper in our tailings. And so we want to make sure that we can manage that as well, because that can have a tendency to consume a lot of cyanide in your process and also drive up your operating costs. So um, we're going to be doing our own full suite of metallurgical test work and maybe making some modifications to the existing facility. So cyanide-soluble sol- copper. So mm-hmm. when you're, you're soaking this stuff in cyanide, obviously it's designed to basically suck the gold out of, of, of the rock, or in this case, the tailings material. The danger there is that the copper gets pulled out with it, right? And exactly, so your, yeah. your finished product isn't a, a dore bar, a combination of gold and silver. It, there, there's also copper in there too that you, okay. Yeah. And is that, that's not an element you want to recover here? Uh, not really in this process because the, the amount of cyanide it consumes to produce that copper is, isn't that, worth it. Isn't yeah, worth yeah, it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. Okay. All right. We're going to get all into a bit of this stuff um, as we go forward, but you mentioned before, uh, that you'd worked in tailings reprocessing uh, earlier in your career. And, you know, this is an interesting conversation for me because when we first invested in in Tarachi with Resource Insider, there was uh, a CEO, Lauren Warner, 
who is now your VPX. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we got, I got to know Lauren a little bit. I was really impressed by his understanding of the geology and, and what his plans were for the Tarachi project, so the non-tailings asset. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, coming down the line, coming down the road, when when I knew Tarachi was going to potentially acquire this magistral, Mike Connor, the, the the chairman, is he executive or chairman? He's no chairman. Yeah, the chairman. Uh, and my partner here at Inventa asked me, you know, do I know anyone with experience in tailings reprocessing? And you were literally the only person uh, <laughs> I've ever met who have done that job. And I think when I called you, you were very happily coming off a, a master's degree two weeks later, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty uh, a pretty niche, niche industry. Uh, I mean, people are recovering and reprocessing tailings all over the world, not just for gold, but for a lot of other commodities. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in the grand scheme of mining, it's very, very just a small pocket of the, of the total mining community for sure. So that's not the only job you'd ever had, right? Because you'd also worked quite a bit throughout Latin America as well. And yeah, I've I worked think that's in, worth touching on your work in Paraguay and, and elsewhere. Yeah, I've lived and worked in Latin America. My Spanish is pretty good um, in Paraguay and Colombia and up you know, as far north as the Yukon. So kind of throughout the Americas in general. Uh, exploring for uranium, for gold, for iron ore, uh, and working on at least two tailings recovery projects as well. So um, certainly I was pretty excited with the opportunity to come on board with Tarachi. Um, you know, the, the prospect of an exploration company having, uh, you know, a soon to be cash producing asset uh, and one that's doing that through through the reprocessing of tailings is what really drew me to Tarachi Gold, as well as the, the management team, Lauren Warner, as you mentioned, who's now our VP of Exploration, excellent geologist, you know, accredited with a number of great discoveries uh, around the world for gold. Uh, Mike Connor is the chairman and the rest of the guys at the Inventa Capital Group, including yourself, um, you know, really seemed like a great company to be a part of, a great team to be a part of, uh, especially being under that Inventa Capital umbrella as well. How's it working out so far? So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Okay, good. So let's talk a little bit about the other assets. Let's talk about Tarachi, because this is what I was excited about and remain excited about uh, when we initially invested. Um, this is also uh, this is also something you've had some good news out about uh, in the not so distant past. A couple, yeah. a couple weeks ago, was it, that you yep. released yep. your results? So let's talk about what the Tarachi assets are what you guys are doing there and why people should care about that. So the Tarachi project was the first project that came into Tarachi Gold uh, with the signing of two option agreements with the option to earn 100% interest in a total of 3,700 hectares. Um, these mining concessions are located in Sonora, Mexico, within that Sierra Madre Gold Belt in the vicinity of Alamos Gold's Mulatos Mine and Agnico Eagles La India Mine. And um, our mining concessions, there's about eight of them in total. Um, but the two that we've been focused on for the past six months or so include the Habali concession, which is just down the road from the Mulatos mine, and our San Javier concession, which is sort of northwest of, of Agniki, and Agniki Isla, India. I think maybe it's worth putting into perspective how big those two mines you just referenced are. Yeah, I mean, Mulatos is a huge mine. They, they produce, I think, around 150,000 ounces per year. Um, you know, the total resources there that have been mined over the years is in, in, in excess of 2 million ounces. Uh, and at La India, they're producing, I think, between 70 and 80,000 ounces of gold per year there. And they've been doing that for quite a while as well. Mm -hmm. So certainly some, some very big, you know, elephant country is sort of where we are up there for sure. So what are results looking like now and, and what's the plan going forward? So the uh, first drilling programs that we ran were on our Habali concession. Mm -hmm. These were um, using an underground drill rig. There is a past producing mine called the Ladura mine on the concession. Uh, really more of an artisanal mine, but you know, they, 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 those artisanal miners made a pretty big cavern down there. Yeah. And so we were able to get an underground mine, our underground drill rig in there to start drilling out the formation that these guys had been mining. Um, we really knew very little in terms of the geometry of this and what we were looking at, um, but we had done some channel sampling across the, the mine workings there uh, earlier last year, uh, coming back with some great results. I think it was uh, around six grams per ton over about 60 meters across the working face there pretty consistently with some, some more bonanza grades within that as well. Uh, so that's what we why we wanted to come in there with a drill rig and actually drill this out. And we were pretty regularly hitting on our first drill holes sort of between four and a half and, and six grams per ton over sort of 15 to, to 20 meter intercepts. Um, uh, including our, our big one, we, we hold on, hold on, <laughs> slow down there. So four and a half, six grams per ton. Yeah. Over how much? 20 meter intercepts. Uh, typically 15 to 20 meter intercepts. Yeah. So that's significant. That's very significant. You're and saying that very quickly, but that's an important <laughs> thing for people to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And we were drilling from sort of within the formation and what we envisioned was, um, perhaps some sort of panel shaped thing between 10 and 15 meters in true thickness, uh, dipping to the east and plunging to the south. Uh, it was a little difficult to sort of ascertain okay, the actual on, orientation, but... <laughs> so, 
dip into the east. Yeah. And plunging, then plunge plunging into the, the south. south. That's like right. That, yeah. Right. So plunge is the way it would go this way. Dip is the way it would go that way. Yeah, it'd be sometimes. dipping like this and then plunging like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the panel. If you, can, if you can remember from our old geology classes that we took together. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, but uh, okay, so you've got this panel that you're exploring. You're yeah. getting high grade results in there. You know, the problem with a lot of gold and silver exploration projects throughout Mexico is there's these super high grades in super small quantities. Right. Your job, I guess, at this point is to prove that's not you. Right, exactly. So what are you doing? How is, how is that going? And what well, are the steps to do that? So far, we've been drilling in very close proximity to the old mining operations. So mm -hmm. all from underground. Uh, we've since brought in uh, a surface RC rig because we're pretty limited to how much drilling we can actually do from the underground operations there. Um, we've done a couple surface drill holes so far. Uh, we had one great hit that we just announced uh, last week on that as well. And um, we're going to be going back and following up with that to determine you know, where we go next with this surface drill rig because we're going to be using that in the future to continue exploring. Um, but what we want to explore is the area between this Ladura mine where we've been drilling and an area about 450 meters to the south called Zaragoza, where there's another series of sort of small underground artisanal workings. And so it's this sort of um, 450 to 500 meter strike length that we believe that we can explore in. Um, we did put a few other holes to the south as well, and we hit some gold mineralization there as well, about 200 meters to the south of Ladura. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do. I mean, it's still early days there. We're still trying to understand what is controlling that high grade gold. Um, there is a fault in the western edge of the mine workings, and we believe that that has something to do potentially with the deposition of the higher grade gold, because we are seeing the higher grades closer to that fault structure. Um, so we'll be going back down. Uh, Lauren is actually going down there at the end of this week um, to work with our geology crew there and, and plan the next steps at Habali. But what what is the overall strategy there, right? You're talking about different areas you're exploring. Is, it, is the goal to connect these things into one larger deposit? Like what is, how do you do that? What are you trying to do? Yeah, I mean, we're trying, we're trying to walk our way south using the surface rig there uh, to determine whether or not mineralization is continuous between those and whether or not we can actually define some tonnage there and, and with the ability to put a, put a resource on the ground on that Helbali concession. Um, so we'll be studying some. We just picked up some old drill core. There were some holes previously drilled on this property in the past, sort of in 2012, 2013. Um, we finally just got a hold of that drill core, so we'll be reviewing that and entering that into our database as well. Yeah. Um, to better help us understand sort of what's controlling the gold there and, and where the potential is to go forward with that. Okay. And so uh, for investors or potential investors sort of sitting at home, what can they expect to hear out of Tarachi out of the coming, call it four to six months? What, are, what should they be looking out for? Yeah, well, we just announced today um, we're starting up a second phase drill program on our San Javier concession. Um, this is one sort of towards the north of our Tarachi mining concession package. Uh, we were drilling there at the end of last year where we were uh, where we identified a mineralized breccia pipe structure uh, that contains sort of five to ten gram per ton grade gold. Um, there seems to be a trend of these mineralized breccia pipes in the area that we're sitting on, uh, some of which were actually mined historically in the past. So we'll be drilling the deeper extents of this breccia pipe intrusive system over the next couple of weeks. Uh, once that wraps up, we should expect to see some, some assay results coming out probably towards the end of July from that. Uh, and then down at our Magistral tailings project, we are slowly sort of marching that towards production. We're doing a, a PEA study with Asenco Engineering right now. We do expect to have the results of that in August of this summer. Um, and from there, we'll have a better understanding of what our actual timeline is to be able to bring Magistral back into production. Mm -hmm. um, what our actual sort of expected ounces per year are going to be. Right now, we're expecting somewhere in the ballpark of around 15,000 ounces per year from that asset. Uh, just with the existing tailings that are there, we expect that to provide feed for probably just under four years time. Um, and really the facility is already there. So we expect the capital cost to bring that online to be to be very low as well. And is, you know, 15,000 ounces per year, is that is that as good as it gets? Or is there a way to scale that up? Is there a way to to add to that with other you know assets or opportunities in the area? Yeah, I mean, we look at Magistral as sort of a foothold asset in that region of Durango. Uh, historically, there were probably at least 800,000 ounces of gold produced from those underground mines that, you know, generated these tailings originally. Uh, but there's really been no modern exploration done since they cl closed in the 1960s. Um, so we do see a lot of potential in that area to make some other acquisitions. Um, both Is this for of other tailings deposits or of actual of smaller mines and, and that sort of thing? Both, both. Uh, we do see some some other tailings material in that area that could potentially 
uh, extend the operating life out of the tailings reprocessing facility, uh, but also some very intriguing hard rock concessions in the area, um, basically covering the old underground mine workings uh, that could have a lot of potential for additional ore at depth or a long strike from those old workings that closed in the 60s, uh, potentially providing actual virgin ore to the mill as well. And that's where we could really increase the, the sort of annual production from there. Have you seen, you know, any really successful uh, tailings reprocessing projects that people could think about as as comps or comparisons to, to what you're trying to achieve here? Uh, absolutely. I think Gold Gold Resources is probably the number one name. Go Gold. Go yeah. Gold. Yeah. I mean, they're they've been reprocessing tailings um, at their Peral facility in, in Chihuahua. That's only about 100 kilometers north of our Magistral project, and they've been doing that very successfully for a number of years now, uh, and using that cash flow to fund exploration on their Los Ricos, pro uh, Los Ricos project in Mexico as well. So we're really not trying to reinvent the wheel here in terms of our business model. Um, it's been very successful for Gold Gold in the past, using these tailings reprocessing facilities yeah. to generate cash flow and put that in the ground, exploring for you know other larger um, gold and silver. And how big are they? Like a almost a billion dollar company, aren't they? I, I think their market cap is eight or nine hundred million dollars these days. And what's yours? We're about 20 million bucks. There you go. That's the sales <laughs> pitch. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> That's right. So you're guaranteeing people you'll be eight or nine hundred million dollars by the end of the year, would you say? Or as long as you say it, not me, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But in all seriousness, you know, there is a lot of upside potential there. And this is I think what the point I'm trying to get at is this is a business model that has been successful before. Right. Because, um, you know, I see this a lot uh, and it's a, it's a criticism I often have in the mining industry that someone says, oh, look, you know, we've got this small mine or past producing mine in X, Y, Z location. Don't worry, we'll turn it on. It'll be cash flowing and we'll use that to fund exploration around it. And nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, they massively underestimate the capital and operating costs of a small mine mm -hmm. and the problems associated with a small mine. And 99.9% .9 of the capital raised or even produced through through production goes back into to keeping the lights on and the wheels right. turning and trying to just get it operating effectively and making money. Um, you know, we saw that in one of the, the, the deals we did at Resource Insider, a company called Northern Vertex, uh, 50,000 ounce per year producer, uh, you know, they, they'd always intended to explore around them, but it took years and years and years to get it cash flowing and making money, which it is doing now. Yeah. But, you know, in conjunction to that, they also went and raised $20 million, which they're now using to explore around it. And it's just so much harder for this to happen. But there are companies, it looks like in the tailing space, particularly, that this is actually being successful. Yeah, it's because the capital is so low to get something like this going because you don't need the crushing and the grinding equipment. You don't need the mining equipment. You don't need the mining infrastructure. Right. Uh, and in our case, you don't even need the mining permits because these tailings are uh, part of the surface rights property, not part of the mineral concession huh. property. So you don't even need an actual mining permit to re-excavate and reprocess these tailings. You just need the permits, environmental permits for operating the facility uh, and for operating our own tailing storage facility as well. So what in an ideal time frame does it take to get something like this up and going for you guys? Is it six months away? Is it five years away? What do you think? Um, you know, the great thing about Magistral is that it already has a facility custom built to reprocess tailings on site. Yeah. Um, we do plan on probably making some modifications or some additions to that facility before we start uh, commissioning the mill. But uh, we expect to have that PEA completed by Asenco sort of in August this year. Uh, that way we can use the back half of the year to make any modifications that we want to make to that facility. Um, you know, do some additional permitting and, and baseline environmental work as well uh, with the intention of bringing that on stream in the first half of next year. And that's what I was going to ask you. So this facility already existed. Mm -hmm. Presumably it's not running because it was not making money. There was an issue. Uh, originally they had built a carbon and leach system there. And the problem with that is because there's this presence of the cyanide soluble copper, the copper has a tendency to take up all the spaces in the activated right. carbon, preventing the extraction of gold. Uh, so they experienced very low gold recoveries, they were losing money. So they decided to replace that facility with a larger mineral crow system. So eliminating the use of carbon. They decided or you've decided? They decided, this already happened. So this was built sort of back in 2017, 2018. So they've replaced it? Yeah, so now the facility is basically brand new. Uh, and then once they spent all the money building that, my understanding is that they had a sort of a stormwater event and it flooded their tailing storage facility, which caused it to overflow. And they were had their environmental permit suspended because of that. Uh, oh, really? They were ordered to do, my understanding is make a bunch of modifications to that storage facility before they could actually have that suspension lifted. And then 
somewhere in that process, they ran out of money or had financial troubles. Uh, it's basically been on care and maintenance ever since. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you guys potentially have to do some modifications to the plan. What do you, I mean, what does that look like? I mean, the details of that will kind of come out with the PEA, but it, yeah. it could be um, putting something at the front end to either recover some of the gold prior to cyanidation or to actually remove some of that cyanide soluble copper first and then go with the Merrill Crow recovery system uh, and basically lower that cyanide consumption by already stripping out some of that copper. So those are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and if not, then we'll just be using the existing Merrill Crow system there and just making sure that we can uh, manage that in a way that the copper doesn't become a problem. All right. Well, Cam, is there anything I didn't ask you about today that I should have, things we should have touched on? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're always on the lookout for you know, another asset or something as well to bring into the company. Uh, ideally, that would be something close to one of our existing assets, ideally close to Magistral, something that could make Magistral more than just a tailings or processing facility, as we touched on, uh, potentially some of those hard rock concessions. So, um, you know, we're, we're certainly on the lookout to to grow Tarachi and to use our existing facilities and assets as sort of basis of operation there in Mexico. We've got uh, a great partnership in Mexico as well with a local partner there who who helps facilitate all of our operations on site. Um, you know, whenever you're working in a foreign country, it's always essential to have great local partners that, yeah. that know the industry, they know the people, they can get you the meetings, uh, particularly in somewhere like Mexico, where a lot of the great mining concessions down there are, are held with, in the hands of a few wealthy families or a few small businesses. And, you know, even just trying to get a meeting with the right people to, to bring them to the table is something that you can't really do from an office in Canada. You really need people on the ground who, who have those connections and have those networks. And uh, we have a great partner in Mexico. His name is Ben. Uh, and he's been helping us facilitate everything from our drilling programs to our permitting to getting the, getting us in, in front of the right people down there. And we really think that's essential. And, and we've got that at Tarachi for sure. All right. Well, Cam, thank Jamie. you very much for coming in today. It's been great. Thanks for having me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is Cam Teamstra, CEO of Tarachi Gold. What's your website? Uh, www.tarachigold.com. Probably could have figured that one out. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, Jamie.